thank you, uh, Koichiro uh, Sensei. It's been extremely, uh, you know, lucid and very compact journey that you made for the for our 90 years relationship that Japan has had with Iran. Um, uh, Mr. Sanjay Singh is very keen to start off with a question. So I, as a moderator, will hold on to my set of questions and take the audience questions first. Uh, Mr. Sanjay Singh, could you please, uh, you know, join us? Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Tanaka, for this very comprehensive talk. And thank you very much, MEI. I think this 10th uh, uh, talk of MEI will be very useful because getting a perspective of a country which is placed similarly to India on the Iran issue is very useful. We are both, uh, both Japan and India are largely dependent on external energy sources. And therefore, like India, I think Japan also would view any disturbance, any conflict in the Persian Gulf as extremely harmful to its interests. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to comment on the question that Mudassar has also posed about there being conversation between Japan and India on the Middle East. And I'm glad that uh, the two prime ministers, as you mentioned, also discussed the Iran situation during their meeting. My question to you, Professor, is what, would, what should Japan and India as members of the Quad do to deal with the Middle East? And what should Japan and India separately, what initiatives can they take jointly to deal with this region? I thank you. Did I respond? Yeah, please do. Okay, well, thank you. Uh Professor Sanjay, um, it's very uh, interesting to hear your views, especially about how the Quad is going to act on the, uh, say, um, joint uh, interest in the Middle East or in the Persian Gulf. One point that I missed to talk about was that, yes, today, even though uh, we are not lifting any uh, amount of uh, Iranian oil uh, to Japan in our oil tankers, uh, Iran remains to be a very important actor, uh, actor in the region for us. Uh, the basic uh, reason to that is that we consider it's not only about Iran, it's not only about the Islamic Republic, it's not only about the Iranians. We consider that the destabilization of the Middle East or the Persian Gulf region as a whole is going to be extremely uh, disturbing for us, uh, for Asia as well. And for that matter, we are trying to engage Iran, not exclude Iran uh, from uh, any sort of a negotiation package that we can offer. Now here, I'll try to answer your question. It's very important to know that um, India is also uh, similar to our, has similar views uh, with uh, ours, and that uh, sort of a dialogue or an engagement Iran uh, with Iran would be uh, necessary and also be, um, say, uh, productive. Uh, unfortunately, we have an administration in Washington that consider that if uh, the other party does not compel, is not, uh, is not ready to um, admit to the, uh, is not to uh, give in to the um, uh, orders or demands of Washington, uh, they are not going to uh, talk to them or so. So it's always uh, so sort of a difficulty that we've been facing with Washington is how to convince or how to uh, make the Americans to uh, agree that uh, uh, talking to the Iranians are not uh, in a way appeasing uh, the Iranians. And at least uh, some for some while, uh, Washington has been more understandable understanding in that matter during the Obama, second Obama administration. But now the uh, era is totally different. Uh, 
or the atmosphere is totally different. Uh, one thing that we may uh, suggest, I may suggest, is that we talk to uh, Washington uh, following the elections, I believe, uh, November elections uh, in Washington and uh, in the United States, and have them uh, alter or at least uh, consider a way out of the current, uh, say, um, I would say, uh, stalemate of both parties uh, only uh, shouting at each other uh, in thin air. But uh, one point, an uh, uh, additional point I would like to make is about the Australians. Uh, I have friends in Australian foreign ministry and I have lengthy talks with them. And I consider that their policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran also shifts from uh, administration to administration. It's not a very constant uh, policy that they have vis-a-vis -vis Tehran. And uh, that is going to be also another uh, issue that we need to have Canberra on board as well. Amuda, um, sir, would you like me to continue to ask questions? Um, uh, or do you think it's answered out here? I think one part is left out about the tension in, uh, uh, tension in the Gulf and how uh, would one see India and Japan cooperating on this issue. So could you please... Well, uh, one th important factor that uh, arose during 2019 was the so-called Operation Sentinel that several of the uh, Persian Gulf literal states did uh, take part as well as Israel uh, joining them from the perspective of intelligence uh, and information gathering and so on and so forth. Uh, we, and as well as Europeans, I do understand, uh, have been called by Washington to join them uh, and to join this initiative, but we kept ourselves away from that. Now, uh, we have our own understanding and also own uh, fleet that has been dispatched to the region and also several um, uh, surveillance aircrafts that have been uh, patrolling the region. Now, uh, we understand that India as well is concerned about the tension rising in and out of the Persian Gulf. The joint effort may be so that we could have a coordination amongst ourselves, but also indirectly with the Americans, because we have already committed ourselves to the Americans that we would be sharing our information with them, even though our fleet would not be joining uh, their um, uh, uh, our naval ships would not be joining their fleet. So one way is to have our coordination by ourselves, if not under the name of Quad, but if uh, uh, under some sort of a bilateral uh, understanding with Delhi and Tokyo. Uh, we have Professor Kichi Chian uh, asking you uh, about what, since Japan and Iran loads the WMDs since both of them are victims. But you support the JCPOA knowing fully well that Tehran is seeks nuclear weapons. So how do you, you know, see this contradiction, uh, contradictory stance that you people mm -hmm. have taken? Well, um, I don't perfectly say that the Iranians are seeking nuclear weapons. They are seeking capability to build a nuclear weapon. So there's a slight tendency, of, I mean, slight uh, difference in the nuance. But also, you can argue and form your viewpoint. I respect that. Uh, uh, the point that I support the JCPOA uh, is twofolded. One is that um, it has been sort of a diplomacy that had been, say, uh, say um, uh, diplomatic effort that have been uh, undergoing for quite a while, uh, including a lot of states that have been concerned, not only the uh, Europeans, but also even the United States. And at one point, people would have to understand it's not only about the Iranian intent or the Iranian capability. What they needed to preserve was the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And in order to pre, uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, preserve the NPT, uh, the any terms or conditions set forth by the parties negotiated with Iran uh, had to honor that. So as long as the NPT is there, uh, the parties uh, to the NPT, uh, the other parties to the NPT, including Europeans as well as the United States, 
had to understand that sort of enrichment capability with Iran would remain, but under a strong scrutiny or a thorough, uh, in, uh, intrus thorough and intrusive uh, inspections regime. And that was provided under JCPOA. And that is the second reason that I support that. And without, uh, without the JCPOA, or if that is totally gone and is reckoned, uh, is uh, wrecked, uh, I see that I would foresee that the Iranians would have sort of a free hand and also a pretext in their own hands to go back to their activities in the early 2000s, not the late 2000s, I mean the early 2000s, which would be more of a concern for us, for India, for Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, Mutasa then draws your attention to the status of non-oil trade between Japan and Iran. <laughs> okay, um, this has gone to its uh, lowest degree. Uh, we hardly see any Iranian goods. We hardly are capable of selling any uh, goods to Iran. Um, it's not only about whether the goods are allowed under the export regimes uh, that we have against Iran. It's also that the transactions through the banking system, the financial institutions, is hampered by the U.S. secondary sanctions. And for that matter, uh, there is visibly very little that you can see. Most of them are related to humanitarian uh, goods. That is quite essential in those days under the uh, spread of COVID-19 virus. Uh, you then have Ankita Sanyal's asking you about how you see China's interest and Japan's interest in the Strait of Hormuz and how do you think it will impact the Japanese interest to connect with the East Central Asian via Iran. I think you partly answered it during your presentation, but right. I think you can give a little more clarity on that. Yeah. Well, um, when I talked about how uh, Iran is important or how the stability of Iran would be important for the rest of the region, including the Arabian Peninsula, I meant that it also applies to Asia. That includes India, that includes South Korea, and in Taiwan, and also China. So for that matter, the freedom of na uh, navigation through the Strait of Hormoz is sort of a, a condition that we both cherish, uh, meaning uh, the Beijing and Tokyo, we both want to see that, um, uh, say, uh, acknowledged and also, um, say, uh, maintained in that matter. Now, uh, in Asia, I mean, talking about Central Asia, uh, this is going to be another uh, set of questions, I believe. Uh, it's not only sometimes that relates to China, but also with Russia as well. I'm not, I won't uh, say, um, go into the uh, issue of Russia today uh, that much, but what I'm trying to tell here is that Chinese interest with ja the, Jap the one of Japanese uh, there are similarities, there are points of convergence, but when, I, when it comes to the regional strategy, I think uh, the current uh, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, and the Free, uh, free and uh, Open Indian Pacific, for FOIP, are competing with each other. And if that uh, competition is going to be, say, held, not only at high seas, but also through Chabahal or through the ports of Iran, for Central Asia, that uh, we would need to see that the Iranians would maintain some sort of a distance uh, with Beijing. But um, it's un quite unlikely at this moment that Iranians would have sort of a uh, say, uh, listening ear uh, to Tokyo. So we may have to s wait until the next U.S. president to see whether they would reverse their actions against Tehran or as long as the U.S. under Trump, President Trump, remains in a very harsh and strict, uh, say, uh, penable uh, manner, then uh, then uh, Tehran has no other way to uh, look for uh, or not look for an outlet, and that remains to be China. Um, question from Al 
Alvitenintojam, sorry if I'm spelling, pronouncing it wrongly. Given the frequent occurrence of dangerous situation in the Middle East, is Japan looking at other sources for its domestic energy security? If yes, who are the potential sources? Uh, well, um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question because we have been uh, saying that. I mean, I mean, I know that the Americans have been saying about uh, the less dependence to Middle East oil since the 1970s and onwards. And it was only until recent that uh, with the development of their shale industry that they actually were uh, now capable of doing so. Now, here in Japan, we've been talking that ever since the 1970s, the first oil shock in 1973, and still we haven't been successful. Uh, a couple of months ago, we recorded another high, uh, say, record of 93% of our oil coming from the Strait of Hormuz, mm -hmm. through the Strait of Hormuz. So that tells uh, that we are still dependent extremely on it, and even though we talk about it, and that we need to, say, uh, diversify our resources. We have done that for coal. We have done that for uh, natural gas, uh, but we haven't been successful in oil. And that remains to be so. But uh, one point that I would like to uh, read, uh, to stress here is that the amount of oil that we are lifting from abo abroad or importing from abroad is diminishing. 20 years ago, it was more than 5 million barrels per day. In these days, it's less than 4 million. And with the current uh, situation of this uh, COVID-19 disastrous economic downturn, uh, we are really uh, down to 3 million. So the total volume that we import from abroad is diminishing uh, year by year, month by month. That's quite so. But still, if you look into the context of from which region, which country, uh, our dependence on Middle East oil is extremely high. And uh, here, I've, I've talked about the year 1972 when we lifted around half of our oil from Iran alone. Today, the same situation is there, but the country is Saudi Arabia. More than 40% of our oil is coming from Saudi Arabia alone, and 25% or so is coming from the UAE. So the, those two combined, uh, we are lifting like th two thirds of our oil from these two states. And we, uh, although we talk about diversification, we haven't been successful. So that's the reality. And um, I, I see that it's, because it's going to remain so. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Singh points out a very interesting, I think, uh, thank you for bringing it up into this forum's discussion. Um, what is Iran's, Iranian's hope proposal and how do you look at it? And mm. what is your reaction to this entire proposal? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yes, um, it was quite interesting even for me to see or hear that the Iranians talked about an external uh, cooperation with their own initiative because their previous or long-standing um, say policy or strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz was that they do not want to see external power or external states, extra regional states uh, in having any say or hand in it. But here, when they talked about, or the President Rouhani talked about it in uh, September 2019 at the UNGA, he did have bilateral talks with the Chinese leader and also to Pr uh, Prime Minister Abe. In both cases, the uh, Iranian president raised some sort of a cooperation uh, or possible cooperation with this HOPE initiative uh, with China and also Iran. We never, say, responded to it. And I don't know how far the Chinese have, uh, say, um, responded either positively or negatively to that. But uh, seeing the most uh, recent uh, cooperation, long-term cooperation agreement between Beijing and Tehran, maybe that it may be, uh, that might be coming in the future. Uh, we had a question uh, which talks about how uh, do you see uh, Japan-Iran relationship post-COVID uh, cooperation? So mm -hmm. that's again, Alvindaran. And you, I think, uh, probably it's a very futuristic right now with Japan's crisis of uh, leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. So, But yet, if you could throw some light on it. 
Well, yes, at least for the time being, uh, for humanitarian gesture and for the humanitarian reason, um, motive, uh, we have provided our, one of our possible, uh, say, uh, medical care agents to Iran for the uh, clinical testing. Unfortunately, this um, agent called uh, Avicon, which was developed by a Japanese pharmaceutical company, has proven negative to have uh, any sort of a positive effect on the uh, patients or those who have been infected of the virus. Uh, we, have the, uh, we have provided this uh, Avigan, uh, this uh, medic medicine or possible medicine to, uh, not only to Iran, to several states in the region, as well as other states in Europe as well, but none of them proved to be successful so far. And I think that that was the only major um, the overture that we have uh, presented towards Tehran on this COVID matter. Uh, regarding the post-COVID uh, eras, well, um, first and foremost, we need to see the sanctions lifted, or at least to see the U.S. administration change course on its sanctions uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, other than that, there is less that uh, very, very little that we can do with them, especially within the uh, economic sphere. Ahmed asked something which is, I think, very upfront in with respect to Japan and uh, Iran relationship is considering that U.S. is making efforts mm -hmm. to impose the arms embargo on Iran. Mm -hmm. How will Japan counter the position? And I think you can sort of take the next question also along with it, which talks about impacting Japan's relationship with Israel mm -hmm. uh, due to the UAE and Israel's agreements. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Well, yes. Um, regarding the U.S. move to reinstate the U.N. arms embargo or to, say, uh, extend the expiring US, uh, U.N. Uh, arms embargo against Iran, uh, from a legal viewpoint, we consider that the U.S. move is null and void. But we haven't voiced that uh, in concern that it may antagonize uh, Washington or personally President Trump. Uh, Prime Minister Abe is known to have a very sincere and cordial relationship with the uh, U.S. president. But for one reason is that he has avoided in annoying uh, or discussing anything that would annoy uh, President Trump. And if we are to take a sort of a certain position vis-a-vis -vis the uh, U.N. arms embargo, um, then that is going to be sort of a... Uh, source that uh, would um, infuriate uh, the U.S. president, and that is unlikely under the uh, Prime Minister Abe's initiative. But maybe the next Prime Minister may have his, his own difficult, uh, different ideas. He may side more even further with uh, President Trump and the United States, and then we may have voice our support to the UN, uh, U.S. Uh, motives and its actions in the Security Council, although we are not currently the member of the uh, UN Security Council. Now, with, our, uh, with regards to the uh, Israelis, yes, do, we do have a sincere relationship with them, and we also voiced our support uh, of the UAE's decision uh, to establish its uh, diplomatic relationship with Israel. And that from one point that we consider that relations should normalize with other states. It's not only about us with other parties, other third parties with other third parties is also welcomed in that source. And if it would lead to any sort of a, say, um, uh, the the uh, escalation of tension in the region, that would be also welcomed. Because uh, if you say, if you consider that the Palestinian issue is an Ar issue for all the Arabs, and if you consider that the Arabs are united in uh, the issue over or the, the Palestinian cause, then we would uh, see another century uh, lost in the future. Maybe nothing would be happening in the future. If we see that uh, there is at least one state moving to another direction, uh, that may lead to other states uh, following suit and uh, gradually 
uh, the normalization of relationship with other, uh, with other Arab states in the region may occur. So we have welcomed the move. But personally speaking, I do not see that as going to lead to a, um, say, um, enormous change in the uh, other Arab states at the moment. It was for the United Arab Emirates, um, well, ability, capability, domestic capability of being a police state, uh, having the capability of silence any sort of opposition within. Uh, I think that was sort of a possible way and gesture that uh, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi was capable of uh, following or to enforcing. Uh, maybe Oman or Bahrain may be inclined to follow the same uh, route, but for them, they are not capable of silencing that uh, sort of a voice if it ever occurs. So at the moment, I would see that only the UAE uh, would be there to, uh, to cherish or to have uh, all the criticism from other states. One last question, since no one has asked this, um, you know, Please. part of the relationship between Japan and the Middle East, is to do with the ODA that uh, mm -hmm. game that Japan plays with respect to the Middle East and the ODA um, tool as a comprehensive security policy. What is your take on it? Because there's lots of academic interest these days on this area of Japan's um, diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, ODA vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East or the region of the Middle East is quite different from our ODA with other states in the Asian continent or in uh, African states. Uh, the difference here is that most of the uh, oil producers, or I, I would say the oil producers and gas producers in the Middle East are the, do not follow into the category of uh, as a recipient to our ODA. So uh, what we are doing there is providing aid to the non-oil states in the region, uh, like Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, previously, Syria was also the recipient, but not anymore. But so um, what we were trying to do was to support the so-called Middle East Peace Initiative or the peace process following the Oslo Agreement in 1993, I believe, uh, to support that indirectly, having the states that have had uh, or normalized its relationship with Israel or, uh, or terminated its hostility vis-a-vis -vis Israel would benefit from this sort of a peace agreement. And Palestinian uh, National uh, Authority uh, and also the uh, PLO and others have been uh, the recipients of this kind of an aid, not Hamas uh, or Hezbollah. But still uh, Lebanon and other states in the region have been the, at the receiving end of the ODA. And our uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Middle East, uh, or the ODA uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East, is to support the Middle East Peace Initiative. Um, do, do you think Japan is also using this as an initiative for the permanent seat in the United Nations? Uh, well, I considered that as a yes uh, in the 1980s and 90s, but not any longer. <laughs> not any longer. Okay. <laughs> Um, anyone else wanting to ask anything more? Yes, Kumar, I think. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I cannot uh, control the temptations. Um, you have suggested that the sanctions have completely removed the uh, Japan uh, importing oil from Iran. But at the same time, China has expanded its footprints in J Iran because through investments. Does it mean that, you know, you are at a crossroads in examining your Iran policy? Because at one level you face American pressure, at the other level you face a Chinese pressure. Does it mean that uh, Japan has, to use a very um, telegraphic term, has Japan lost Iran forever? Mm -hmm. Well, I hope not. But uh, the problem here is that uh, I've been, we, we've been talking extremely and extensively with Washington over the past three decades, at least as I understand, <laughs> is that if we leave Iran alone, it would do no good rather than harm. And it would do harm more than uh, good. And that eventually there will be other states replacing Japan's role as an importer of Iranian oil 
and they may have more say to Iran or more, more influence to Iran, mm. but, necessarily, but, um, not, but not necessarily following the lines of Washington. Mm. So backfilling, as we call it, uh, has been a source of concern for a lot of years, and we've been extremely cautious in, in telling te uh, Washington that they need to take that into consideration, but uh, they never listened. And unfortunately, what we are gradually seeing to materialize is our concern is happening uh, as we speak. Any more questions? I don't see anything anymore in the chat box, but anyone who would openly want to ask a few questions? Uh, anything, if, if I can just add. Um, you know, um, does it mean that uh, are you looking at the Arab countries differently now that Iran is becoming a problem. Are you engaging with the Arabs at the political level, not just only in the energy transactions, but mm -hmm. have there been political engagement with the Arab because mm -hmm. of the, the difficulties you face in Iran? Well, um, the, uh, re with respect to the Arabs, uh, we consider that uh, we need to maintain sort of an equal stepping with the Arabs, between the Arabs and the Iranians. Mm -hmm. It's not only that we need to take care of the Arabs. I mean, we, we have no, say, economic problems or any sort of a sanctions problem with uh, the Arab states, uh, 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 unless it's, we were talking about Syria or Yemen. But uh, with regards to the political, uh, say, weight that most of the Arab states do hold, uh, they are not capable or they may not be capable of, say, securing the entire region. Of course, mm. Iran is not capable of securing the entire region. It may be capable of disturbing the entire region, as I say. But uh, non, not, non, not, not single, no single state in the region is capable of maintaining the stability. And it, that also applies to the United States. Even if all became silent and the United States is there, the region would not be stable uh, either. So what is required is that at least the major players, actors, including Iran, Saudi Arabia, and to an extent these days, uh, Iraq as well, all these three, at least, that are, say, uh, facing the um, uh, Persian Gulf would have to act uh, not on their own, collectively, in, a single, in, a, in one direction, with an understanding that they would work together. If Iran is gone, I foresee that there will be turmoil uh, in the region. If Saudi Arabia is gone, equally the same. Mm. We've seen during the 2000s, following 2003 Iraqi invasion by the United States, how a single state like Iraq, which holds only several kilometers of its, uh, say, um, coastal waters to the Persian Gulf, could destabilize the region. Mm. Now, if that happens with Iran, which has the longest uh, seashore across the to be disastrous, and so is Saudi Arabia, UAE equally. So uh, we, there needs to be a certain understanding uh, that all of them is required to be there. Yes, Shabani. Yeah. Uh... Are we, any more questions around here or uh, do we look at, yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Tanaka Koichi for joining us okay. late evening from Tokyo uh, on a very interesting subject of uh, concern today, more so because we move into a, you know, probably an era of uncertainty after the COVID followed by a, changes in leadership that one is witnessing. Um, you have Japan, you know, looking at leadership change. America is up for a game changing, hopefully. hopefully. And we see a more stabilities originating within the alliance system, which has also been a part of a with respect to Japan-US relationship, which definitely impacts the your relationship world. So we look forward to hearing you post the U.S. Uh, election. Mm -hmm. 
and hope that uh, we can again engage you in much more uh, you know open discussion maybe a panel discussion kumar where we can bring in uh, people who would be in uh, you know looking at the post election uh, us and how it would impact the middle east right. thank you so much for being with us and thank you audience for your interesting and very uh, pertinent questions uh, and uh, you know kumar as usual you've been upfront in bringing across people from across the world into this forum to engage and discuss in the covid situation where all of us are doing work from home thank you so much everybody for joining thank you thank you thank you thanks bye bye